I am pleased to welcome you to the IIEA's webinar today. My name is Derry Fitzgerald and I'm a member of the Institute. We're delighted to be joined today by Professor Candice Rondo, who has been very generous in taking time out of her busy schedule to speak to us today. Um, Candice Rondo will speak for uh, 20 minutes or so. After that, we will be have a, a Q&A session. Uh, you will be able to join the Q&A session um, by using the function on Zoom. That will you should see that button on your on your uh, screen. And um, please feel free to add the questions as they occur to you during the presentation, and we will come to them at the end of the presentation. Um, a reminder that today's presentation is um, and and the Q and A session are both on the record, and please feel free to join us on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So, what is the Wagner Group, and what do we know of it? The Wagner Group ostensibly is a private military company, which has been. Uh, uh, financed by one of the Russian oligarchs. And it has become one of the most discussed features of Russia's expanding global ambitions. From Ukraine to Mali, the Wagner fighters have backstopped Russian military, guarded critical infrastructure, and served as emissaries of the Russian state to war-torn and embattled governments around the world. Yet much of the standard narrative uh, surrounding the Wagner Group is wrong, and deliberately so. Drawing on years of research and reporting, uh, as well as uh, analysis of a large scale of social media, uh, Professor Rondo will trace the origins of the Wagner Group, how the Wagner smokescreen has emerged, and how it is operating today. If I could now, I'd like to say a few words on Professor Rondo by way of introduction and then hand over to, to you. Um, Candice Rondo directs Future Frontlines, a public intelligence service for next generation security and democratic resilience. A journalist and public policy analyst, she is professor of practice and fellow at the Milikian Center for Russian Eurasian and East European Studies and the Center on the Future of War at Arizona State University. Before joining New America, Professor Rondo served as Senior Program Officer at the UN Institu Institute of Peace, where she launched the Resolve Network, a global research consortium on conflict and violent extremism, and served as a st strategic advisor to the UN Special Inspector General for Afghanistan reconstruction. She has documented and analyzed political violence around the world for the Washington Post and the International Crisis Group. Before going to the joining the Post in 2009, Professor Rondo uh, covered criminal justice um, in Maryland and Virginia where she was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team with other Post reporters on the 2007 um, Virginia Tech massacre. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Professor Rondo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derry. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to speak here today. It's, um, it's really a, a rare treat to be able to talk to folks at such length uh, about the Wagner Group, which is a topic that has been a point of obsession for me for the last five years. So I'm very, very grateful to you uh, and to your colleagues at the IIEA and to the audience for joining us today. So, you know, a, a couple months ago uh, in early September, I, I traveled to Ukraine to see what I could find out about how Russian mercenary operations were playing out there. And I mostly stuck close to Kiev um, in that area. And comparatively speaking, things were much calmer than they are now. Um, but while I was there, I met with the mayor of Bucha, uh, and you all will know Bucha, of course, um, because of its unfortunate fame uh, for a number of large-scale war crimes that occurred early on in the war there. Uh, and the mayor of Bucha recounted in grisly detail how Russian soldiers of fortune with the Wagner Group went from house to house searching for members 
of Ukrainian armed forces and government agencies who lived in this upscale suburb um, near, near Kiev. And Bucha was one of several stops on my trip, actually. And uh, I was quite curious to find out that actually war crimes uh, in the Kiev area committed by the Wagner Group were quite prevalent um, and much more, uh, much more pronounced than I think many people understand. So after my visit to Bucha, the next day, I, I traveled to a neighboring town called Motajin, about 45 minutes away uh, to the west of, of Kiev, where I heard similar stories. Eyewitnesses there told me how well-armed Russian mercenaries had spent nearly a month terrorizing everyone while they mounted drone operations aimed at targeting Kiev during the initial phases of the war. And then survivors of the ordeal also recounted how shortly before the town was liberated in late March, Wagner Group operators, operatives had taken the town's mayor, her husband, and young 20-something son, a promising footballer, to a house um, that the Russians had occupied and then tortured them to death. After the town was liberated, the bodies of the mayor and her family were discovered in a mass grave at the edge of town. It was a devastating story, but it was one that was eerily similar to events that were happening halfway around the world in Africa, almost precisely at the same time in a remote part of Mali. That same month in early March, when the mayor had been killed in Ukraine, uh, armed forces loyal to the government of Mali and Russian mercenaries summarily executed an estimated 300 civilian men in the rural town of Mora. The impact of Russian-backed mercenaries with the Wagner Group on, on the security situation in Mali has since, of course, been uh, a flashpoint uh, in a churning debate between the UN Security Council uh, about increased reports of human rights violations in the country and the effect of the Russian presence on the security situation there. In June, the situation became so acute that it sparked tensions between the five permanent members of the Security Council and very, very nearly derailed the UN's largest effort to stabilize the Sahel region of Africa. And more recently, as you all probably know, uh, the influx of Russian mercenary forces has not only resulted in the, in the departure of French forces, uh, but it has led Paris to cut off development aid to Bamako after, over fears that Russian paramilitaries will leverage the aid to expand the Kremlin's destabilizing influence in both Mali and the Sahel region writ large. So those fears are actually pretty well-founded. Russian soldiers of fortune have emerged as serious threats to the protection of civilians and peace and stability in many countries around the world, as we can see from these stories. The Wagner Group connection to war crimes and human rights violations is actually not coincidental, nor is it new. Everywhere they go, Russian soldiers of fortune are trailed by allegations of horrific, of horrific atrocities. From Ukraine to Mali and beyond, Russian fighters operating under the banner of the Wagner Group have been implicated in dozens of war crimes. In Sudan, for instance, um, despite denials from the backing from the Sudanese government, there's evidence that Russian-backed mercenaries are involved in illicit profiteering from gold mining. Um, in the Central African Republic, the UN has reported concerns about uh, Russian involvement in the systematic use of rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war. The number of alleged Wagner Group human rights violations in Libya, meanwhile, is so high that it's easy to lose count. It's actually no accident that when the Wagner Group is involved in military action, a profusion of confusing narratives seems to crop up about who they are, what they are, uh, who they work for, and why. That's because the reality is that the Wagner Group is one part instrument of psychological warfare, one part deception operation, and one part deniable proxy force for sketchy missions the Kremlin wants to keep quiet. Strategically speaking, their covert operations, real and imagined, are critical for Russia's strategy for sanctions evasion and for managing the risks of conflict escalation in places where Russian forces and entities are engaged in clear violations of international law and other competitors like the United States and NATO partners are present. Tactically speaking, Russian mercenaries run reconnaissance operations. Uh, they provide targeting intelligence, military training, logistical support, infrastructure protection, all of the things that you would expect for a private security company. Their area of operations, <clears throat> their area of operations actually encompasses the world as we've just discussed. Um, but the most important thing to understand is they work where Kremlin controlled state companies also work uh, in the area of fossil fuel mining, fossil fuel extraction, mining, and the distribution of arms and training and equipping uh, of local forces. The US and EU have sanctioned the, the Wagner Group and individuals suspected of being involved in the Russian mercenary operations 
but it's not really clear what effect those moves have had on constraining uh, Russia's deployments um, of, of mercenary contingents. More recently in Washington, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not it's time for Washington to designate the Wagner Group a foreign terrorist, uh, 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 sorry, a foreign terrorist organization. Um, that's a pretty controversial move, and not surprisingly, um, it's not um, unattractive to those in Kiev who are also experiencing um, a great deal of terror from uh, Wagner Group operatives in, in Ukraine. And such a move, of course, would be helpful in so much as it would prohibit the provision of material support to Russian mercenaries going forward. And in theory, it would give intelligence and law enforcement agencies wider latitude to scrutinize the activities of individuals and firms linked to Russian contract operatives. Given the lack of substantive and effective policy action so far, sounds like a pretty good deal. There's only one real problem. The Wagner Group does not exist or at least it doesn't really exist in the same way most people think it does. It's not a company in the classic sense. It doesn't operate like its Western counterparts, like Blackwater. Uh, that comparison is actually uh, not a fair one. So this begs the question, what is the Wagner Group and, and what do we really know about it? Uh, a word of warning, this may require a little bit of myth busting and by necessity involves uh, a stroll through history and I'll try and make it as brief as possible. So let's start with myth number one. Um, the Wagner Group is the first private military security company in Russia. Not quite. Uh, the private security industry in Russia actually uh, well predates Wagner Group by at least 30 years uh, and well predates the um, involvement of Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, the man we all know as Putin's chef, um, who has been, uh, who has claimed um, to be the main financier and founder of the Wagner Group. To understand the origin story of the private market for force in Russia, we have to go back to the Cold War era, uh, when the world was more or less divided between two poles and the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, the competition and the basic geographical factors that drew these firm lines um, between those two poles, between the US and the Soviet Union, also uh, drew transit and trade relationship lines around the world, uh, including for the distribution of energy and arms. For states that were partners of either the Soviet or American energy trade or military technical agreements, um, essentially they bought into architectures uh, that have implications um, for the ways in which the military is on the ground um, and the use of force uh, in places like Africa and the Middle East and Asia uh, is deployed. That's still very much the case today. The legacy of that arrangement, uh, the division between NATO and the Warsaw Pact um, uh, alliances are, are actually still extant in, in large parts of Africa, uh, in parts of the Middle East, uh, and that cleavage is very much what sort of services or provides um, the, the pathway for Wagner Group operatives uh, to do what they do today. It's important to remember that another factor in the growth of Russia's private military security industry was simply the collapse of the Soviet Union itself and the downsizing of the military. Um, at the time in 1991, uh, roughly 3 million, uh, about 2.6 million um, troops were under Soviet control. Uh, they were downsized progressively over the years to about 1 million. And as you know now uh, from watching this mobilization in, in Ukraine, um, there has been some difficulty um, with mobilizing large scale forces on that scale uh, since then. So that means a lot of men uh, of fighting age males were out of work uh, and, and needed a place to, to earn a living. Uh, and very quickly uh, after Putin took power in 2000, the consolidation of state-run industries like shipping, um, oil, gas, um, you know, energy production, extraction, uh, as well as arms production and distribution allowed for some of those um, men, uh, military age men, to join up as private security providers in small scale detachments initially. Um, that did change uh, over time. Uh, and that's where we come into myth number two. You might have heard uh, a lot about this idea that Russia actually prohibits uh, the uh, formation of mercenary companies or private military companies. Um, so myth number two is it's, it's against the law for private military companies to operate outside of Russia. This too is a little bit misleading. It's true 
that Article 359 of the Russian Criminal Code prohibits Russian citizens from fighting for profit in a foreign army. Uh, and there are several laws on the books um, that actually grant um, special status uh, for certain types of, of armies uh, or uh, military forces. Um, but the reality is in 2007 and 2008, the biggest shift that allowed for the deployment of large scale quasi private forces under the Russian under Russian law um, was a, a state decree that gave Gazprom, Russia's largest uh, gas production company and actually one of the largest in the world, and Rostec, uh, which is the, the sort of mothership uh, arms producer at, uh, for Russia and the state arms agency, uh, were given permission to hire their own private armies. And so uh, the gene genealogy actually of, um, of the Wagner group stems from this particular moment in time when the law shifted and allowed, allowed large scale state run companies uh, to begin hiring their own armies. Um, at that time, Gazprom had in the, in the uh, from 2007 or so, about 30,000 um, armed men uh, under its control. And that's a pretty large, large scale army actually. Uh, and Rostec, I don't know what the numbers are, but they're certainly well in the tens of thousands. So Putin really um, also has used that law um, and leveraged it going forward uh, to expand the remit of private security providers that deliver things that are called designated as strategic goods. Strategic goods include oil and gas, in large part because oil and gas are a big part of Russia's government revenue streams. Without oil and gas, it would be very difficult for Russia to operate uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And its sovereign wealth fund, uh, of course, um, is completely funded, almost entirely funded by oil and gas revenues. Um, but also, uh, you know, a strategic commodity, of course, are arms. Uh, that is one, one of the other main exports uh, that has, you know, great value add uh, for Russia uh, and is increasingly very important for its positioning in the world. Um, so the delivery of those goods is another um, decree uh, that allows for um, private military contingents to operate uh, in more offensive um, frameworks uh, when delivering goods to particularly a combat zone like Syria uh, or Libya, as we have seen over the last five years. So let's talk about myth number three. Um, I think the most important one, because I think it's the one that's in the news the most these days. Um, let's talk about Yevgeny Prigozhin. Myth number three is Yevgeny Prigozhin is the mastermind uh, behind the Wagner Group. If you have been paying attention at all to the news, you will have seen videos of Yevgeny Prigozhin, a sort of tall, balding man, um, marching around a, a prison, uh, giving speeches and trying to recruit prisoners uh, to his cause. Uh, you'll note that he has been very critical, uh, very vocally cr critical recently uh, of the war effort um, and has called for more aggressive moves uh, to mobilize forces uh, in Ukraine. And his profile progressively, especially after he admitted both um, being the founder of the Wagner Group, but also interfering in US uh, elections in 2016 and 2018 and 2020. Um, mm -hmm. After those admissions, uh, of course, he's received a lot of notice and attention. And there's good reason for that. Um, he certainly is uh, somebody who is important to the Wagner Group um, cause or effort or mission. Um, and he deserves credit for his very adept manipulation of military defense procurement bidding processes, uh, as well as his very clever use of shell companies to skirt sanctions and embargoes and to insulate the activities of contract soldiers from too much public scrutiny. He's done very well at that actually. But the sale and transfer of large scale weapons, of, of large scale weapons platforms like the kind we saw in Libya uh, where you had large scale Pantsir anti-aircraft missile batteries that were surreptitiously shipped uh, via the UAE to anti-government rebel forces would have been impossible without the additional and direct knowledge and help of the Ministry of Defense in Russia uh, and without the knowledge and decision-making of those in the Kremlin. Uh, so to say that Yevgeny Prigozhin operates entirely on his own is a little bit misleading um, and certainly um, does not reflect the full scale and scope of the networks that support Wagner Group operations. What this really tells us is that the Wagner Group is better described really as a paramilitary cartel 
much like Mexico's Sinaloa drug cartel or even OPEC, Wagner Group detachments, first and foremost, are the enforcers of price fixing arrangements between Russian state energy and arms companies and host governments like those in, in Mali or in Sudan uh, or, or CAR. Their presence, as we've seen, eliminates competition from the West, right? France is no longer present in, in Mali, uh, so there's success there. And secondly, Prigozhin himself is more kind of like a, uh, well, he's kind of like a COO meets chief branding and marketing officer. His real expertise and success lies, in, it lies as much in selling the idea that the Wagner Group operates entirely independently of the Kremlin as it is a unitary company. Uh, in actual fact, the military operatives who are training and equipping and fighting alongside local forces in Mali and Ukraine are part of a network of military contingents and detachments that are contracted through intermediary front companies that provide services to Russian Ministry of Defense via its primary um, procurement arm, the joint stock company Garnizon. Garnizon is a holding company that is directly subordinate to the Ministry of Defense and its subsidiaries are variously responsible for everything from repairing military planes, uh, tanks, and supplying troops with MREs uh, and bed sheets. So what we're really talking about when we refer to the Wagner Group is really the brokerage firms that organize the shipping, um, the charter companies for flights, not customs and uh, warehouse traders, wet lease, air transport forms, firms, travel and accounting agencies that pay contract soldiers salaries. Where Prigozhin and other front men come in is they manage these quasi-governmental and covert operations and arrangements, shielding the Kremlin's activities from international scrutiny at a time when it could not be in a more precarious position. To understand how this arrangement works, it's really important to understand the origin story of what we now know today as the Wagner Group. And I'm gonna come close now to, to the end of my, my points here because I wanna make sure we have time for um, Q and A. But the genealogy of the Wagner Group uh, and affiliated Russian military contractor contingents can be traced directly to the networks of strategic enterprises that were serviced primarily by former KGB agents, uh, now known as FSB, um, and uh, to, to a lesser degree, former GRU agents. Uh, who were eventually you know, out of work through this downsizing I mentioned earlier uh, and found themselves in a position to kind of leverage their knowledge of military services and, and military operations uh, to provide services to state-run companies. One of the most important of these in the genealogy and the kind of family tree of the Wagner Group is the Moran Security Group, uh, which is one of the early progenitors uh, that um, actually hired um, Dmitry Utkin uh, the commander of the Wagner Group um, that we all know now today, very famously, uh, first to work in Syria uh, under the a detachment known as the Slavonic Corps. As the Arab Spring rocked the Middle East region, Moran's security presence and that of other Russian security firms like RSB Group became much more pronounced. So that instability drew these essentially state designated private military security contractors uh, into, the, into the war zones uh, that were erupting as the Arab Spring unfolded. So enterprises like Gazprom, Luke, Luke Oil, Tatnef, Stroytrans Gaz, all of these energy firms had huge stakes in places like Libya and Syria. Uh, and they also had uh, under their employ contingents of military intelligence vet veterans uh, who were retired active reserve special operators or Spetsnaz officers who do basically overtime or rotate back and forth into active duty service and reserve service, uh, depending on when their contracts are, are, are actually uh, in, in operation. So that's the kind of general kind of logistical arrangement of the Wagner Group. But it's important also to remember one other thing. Um, this schema, it also carries with it the idea that um, the Wagner Group is one company and the reason we believe that largely is because Prigozhin has also been very good uh, at manipulating large scale um, social media campaigns online, uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Vakontaktia, uh, in, local, in the local press with uh, standing up online websites that are news sites. Um, you can see the examples of this in the CAR, uh, examples of this in Mali. And that is another key component of, of the service that. Prigozhin provides in terms of creating a unitary brand for the Wagner Group. And psychologically, this is very important 
uh, for a number of reasons. One, it allows Russia to project power outward and, and to give the impression that it can be everywhere and anywhere at all times. Uh, when in actual fact, as we've seen in, in, in the Ukraine mobilization, there are a, a lot of limitations to Russia's ability to mobilize uh, military force at scale. Um, the other, of course, important part is um, the reputation that they have now gathered uh, as kind of um, extremely aggressive operatives um, also gives Russia the ability to create more influence with local leaders, uh, like in places like uh, Mali, uh, where we've seen uh, that the junta there is quite impressed uh, with the kind of psychological value um, of being able to terrorize the local population into submission. So what's to be done? Uh, this is, sounds like a pretty bad situation. Uh, and uh, of course, there are growing concerns about uh, the, the reach of the Wagner Group, the, the impunity um, that seems to trail them. I think the first step is to really treat the problem for what it is. This is a Russian state-backed organized crime cartel that often operates like a paramilitary group. The second step is to work diligently to trace the wagon group's activities and interests. And with concerted effort, you can really understand and know um, the shell companies that make up this covert network. And they can be traced through uh, bills of lading, customs, trade data, and other open sources that are publicly available to anyone who cares to explore them. And the last step is perhaps the most daunting, but the most necessary. It may be time for the world uh, and interested parties to really consider undertaking a multi-jurisdictional approach to the prosecution of Wagner Group affiliated entities um, and individuals for crimes against humanity. Such an effort would without doubt be daunting uh, and would involve a considerable amount of time and resources, but doing nothing is likely a far more costly alternative. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Professor Rundle. That was uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, and if if I could just follow your last point uh, with a question. I mean, the United Nations um, have made a number of attempts to get a collective view on how to control such mercenaries. Uh, what is the present position on that? Uh, has any resolution been passed? Um, have any steps been taken in that area? Yes, so this is a very sticky issue um, for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, unfortunately, the United Nations you know, has a DNA problem. Um, the, the five permanent members uh, include, of course, Russia, uh, and China, of course, has allied itself very closely with Russia's position. And so we've seen you know, a good example of this is the, the repeated attempts to bring um, Russian mercenaries to heal or to contain uh, or to make them accountable for their actions in Mali. We've seen a number of resolutions forwarded there um, pertaining to uh, the concerns about the Wagner Group in particular. And China and Russia have blocked those resolutions repeatedly. There is, of course, the UN um, expert working group on mercenary activity, uh, which has been very closely monitoring um, and I think quite aggressively monitoring the activities of the Wagner Group in lots of different locations around the world. The challenge, of course, is that the UN is probably not the right venue to pursue um, accountability simply because of this DNA problem with the Security Council. So the question becomes, um, at what stage do we understand the Wagner Group's activities, uh, and particularly their violations of the international law, to rise to the level where they might be they might be treated uh, differently um, in terms of how we think of them in international justice terms? So um, a good example here is um, maybe a comparison would be the Triple I M, which was formed uh, right after. Uh, I guess 2016, 2017, when uh, the UN found, again, it, at an, it itself had an impasse in terms of bringing justice to um, ISIS um, uh, operatives in, in Syria and Iraq, um, but it essentially formed a special um, investigative body uh, that oversaw and still continues to look into uh, crimes committed by, by ISIS operatives. It is not a perfect solution uh, because it doesn't necessarily point to reparations for victims, but it is one option. Um, I think there are probably other options, particularly because uh, the Ukraine conflict um, has some special contours that lend itself um, to the possibility of seeking out a prosecution of crimes of aggression uh, 
And without doubt, um, because, because there was so much pre-planning involving Wagner Group operatives um, and pre-deployment, even before hostilities began uh, of Wagner Group operatives inside Ukraine, that would make for a very good case, a very good opportunity uh, to pursue maybe a, a unique uh, means of um, ensuring that there was accountability for war crimes. Uh, thank you. I, again, I'm going to follow on uh, your, your answer um, and in relation to uh, difficulty for the United Nations. I mean, uh, people are aware that uh, private military companies, there are a, a large number of paramilitary companies um, or private military companies operating throughout the world. Um, could you draw a clear distinction between how the Wagner Group operates and how um, the other private military companies may operate? Well, it's, I mean, obviously, <laughs> the private military security industry is a multi-billion dollar, you know, multi, multi-jurisdictional industry, right? So we have, you know, operatives, we have large scale companies that operate uh, outside of the unit. You know, uh, uh, in the U.S., in Australia, in the U.K., very famously South Africa, um, and all of them in, early in their early in their genesis had very similar problems actually with um, ac accusations around human rights abuses and uh, misuse of force. And you'll remember, of course, executive out outcomes is probably like the most famous example of this, um, where uh, there was a lot of abuses uh, in in Southern Africa uh, on their watch. Um, but the maturation of those industries, the public scrutiny uh, of those activities did lead to a couple of big moves. Um, most famously, of course, uh, the Blackwater incident uh, involving the shootings in Nisor Square in Iraq in 2007 led to the adoption of the International Code of Conduct on um, Military Force on, on uh, the Association of uh, Private Security Forces, uh, otherwise known as ICOCA. Um, that accord, the Montreux document, lays out kind of the standards by which private military security op operators should be uh, held to account um, and how, how they should also operate, usually within the bounds of international human humanitarian law. Um, and in fact, interestingly, the Moran Security Group and RSB Group actually uh, early on uh, signed on to those accords, um, but seem to have since fallen, fallen afoul of them. Um, so I guess the substantive difference between these Russian contingents and let's say American or Australian or sort of Western uh, style outfits is Western outfits are genuinely registered firms that are genuinely private. That's the first distinction. Okay. They are their own corporations. Mm -hmm. They're headed by their own CEO or director, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, as such, they assume liability um, under the color of the laws in which the jurisdictions in which they operate, right, um, openly. And they, you know, and that's part of their sort of corporate DNA. The, the Wagner Group, right, it actually is a number of different <laughs> contingents that are actually genuinely registered as corporate entities in Russia. Um, some, you know, uh, are actually private security providers um, that legally were, uh, operate in a gray zone in, in so much as uh, they originally had a domestic remit, but then they, they expanded their um, international remit once they began signing on with state-run companies. But because their primary operative jurisdictional relationship is dictated by Russian law, um, and their primary contractual relationship is with state entities, um, that is the fundamental difference. Uh, they, are, they are not really their own masters in many ways um, because of the strange kind of state capitalism arrangements and because of the laws that I, I alluded to earlier that give them kind of a special status, almost a, a quasi-governmental status um, when they're operating in combat zones and delivering strategic commodities. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a question from uh, Seamus Martin. He's the former international editor of our Irish Times. Um, what does Professor Rundle know about another mercenary group called Redoubt, 
which is reported to be involved in the conflict in Ukraine. Some sources suggest that it is linked to the GRU, uh, especially for their tasking and military intelligence. So um, anti-terror Reddit is one of the on, the, on the genealogy tree of what we know as the Wagner Group. So again, I would just point out that, you know, there are three or four different companies. There's Grand Security Group, um, RSB Group, Anti-Terror Reddit, uh, Anti-Terror Oral, uh, and a couple of other small, smaller ones. All of these kind of operate almost in a confederation. Um, and it's, in some ways, that's the best way to think about their relationship to the Wagner Group. Um, essentially, it is a confederation almost, uh, consisting of these detachments, but primarily backed by their relationship with another organization that you may have heard of called Liga, um, which is the League of Veterans of Foreign and uh, Domestic Wars, uh, local wars, uh, which is based in St. Petersburg. And it is a legal entity, it is a veterans organization uh, that is responsible for you know, providing social services uh, support uh, to former uh, military officers uh, and, and soldiers. Uh, but it has been the primary engine for recruitment. Uh, it has been the primary engine for um, organizing this confederation. And one of its chief uh, commanders, Andrei Troshev, is, is very close to Prigozhin. In fact, now, uh, more openly, you can see them um, kind of you know, tag to each other in the press when talking about the Wagner Group. So um, anti-terror Reddit's sort of lineage uh, comes from uh, what we now know today as the FSB uh, Alpha Group. Uh, which is an anti-terror unit that was started actually in, uh, out of the Afghan war uh, that has since kind of grown in its influence and power. Uh, and it is considered kind of like the, I guess, the A-team um, uh, of counter-terror operations on the FSB side. Thank you. Um, our next question um, is coming from uh, Maud Byton, uh, company director for Central African Republic at Concern. Uh, concern is a large aid agency here in Ireland. And it, it's a question really in relation to the safety of personnel. Does Candice have policy or operational recommendations for humanitarian actors who operate in the area where Wagner would have a presence? Well, this is a, becoming a really interesting question. And this has come up actually much more often now because I think... Um, you know, the Wagner Group's presence, particularly in Central African Republic, has been so long running and is so well established now, and its footprint is pretty substantial there. Um, you know, and there was a conversation I had the other day with a group of colleagues about the same topic, sort of how to deal with uh, their presence. The challenge is, of course, you want to get aid to where it's needed. Um, and uh, as you would if you were any other humanitarian organization, you have to be neutral on some level, which means you have to talk to these actors. Um, I think that the most important thing is just to be aware of the limitations, um, perhaps, um, about um, the things that they will and will not allow as a result of their kind of overall mission set and their overall set of relationships, um, not only on the ground, but with the Kremlin. And I do think, you know, to some degree, um, taking care to document um, behaviors that are out of bounds and sharing that information uh, confidentially with the right people uh, can be helpful uh, in terms of just keeping the, the spotlight on their activities. Uh, it's really important that, it, you know, if, if in the process that they're becoming more and more entrenched um, and you still, you have to deal with them uh, and, you, you know, in the delivery of aid, um, it's still important that they are scrutinized um, and that they are held to account. And so um, there's neutrality um, for the mission set of delivery of aid, but then there's kind of overcorrection of neutrality where you're, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you're not sharing the right information with the right people, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have a next question is from Mary Cross. Mary Cross is the chair of the IIEA Security and Events um, Group. And Mary asks, what is the scale of the Wagner Group's activity in Ukraine relative to the Russian troop deployment? Well, <laughs> I think it is becoming extremely difficult to discern. Um, I mean, I, I, I know that 
Um, you know, their presence in and around Bakhmut, of course, is pretty entrenched. Uh, all sort of all along that eastern corridor um, near Kharkiv uh, in the northeast, um, they've managed to entrench themselves quite well, and that's largely because that's kind of their their origin point. Um, before 2014, there was no Wagner, Wagner group. You'll remember um, there was no need for a Wagner group um, because there were a bunch of other little detachments, um, some of them volunteer, um, that were deployed to Donbas to occupy parts of Luhansk and um, uh, and Donetsk. It, but the, the first insertion point was uh, Luhansk for a number of individuals who were tasked with executing commanders uh, of pro-separatist for forces who were viewed as intransigent or kind of, you know, uh, running wild. And that is actually the, the origin story of the Wagner Group. And so it's not surprising to find um, that their presence in Luhansk is still very strong. Uh, in fact, it's kind of their, it's their main kind of fortress, as it were. Um, they're certainly not in, in the forward uh, operations that they once were uh, when, they, when the invasion started. Uh, they are important logistics providers. They're important for air defense. They're important for reconnaissance. Um, but it is difficult to discern now uh, with these prisoners uh, who have now become part of the recruiting chain uh, to, to truly discern exactly um, what it is uh, they're doing other than providing you know, uh, kind of forward support uh, and essentially acting as cannon fodder um, in a situation where Russia has very low capacity to mobilize uh, and keep forces in a cohesive manner. Thank you. Uh, my next question is from Keen Fitzgerald. Uh, he's part of the research team here at the IIEA. Um, is it clear that Wagner has sustained staggering losses in Ukraine's high intensity conflict? Could we see the, the Wagner group being withdrawn from Ukraine in order to refocus their area of operations on more vulnerable regimes in the Middle East or Africa or Asia. So then they get, we're going back to the question of, uh, they got a, a specialist skill set that could be more useful to the Russians elsewhere. Uh, well, so it's really a matter of economics. <laughs> um, until relatively recently, again, I think the prisoners are an exception to the rule um, and that we have to set them aside a little bit when we're thinking about the recruitment base and kind of the, the, the um, those who actually populate these positions within the Wagner group. So setting that aside, I will say, generally speaking, um, the vast majority of recruits in these private military security detachments uh, that fly in the flag of the Wagner Group, whether they be, you know, Reddit anti-terror, or uh, you know, anti-terror or row or Moran Security Group, whatever the detachments, um, they all get paid much more money than the average Russian soldier, um, and so that's going to be a huge incentive for anybody who's out of work or who's a reservist, um, and even fr frankly, um, mobilized soldiers who, for whatever reasons, um, after their conscription duty, uh, decide to continue on, uh, it will probably be pretty attractive to them to be earning you know, almost twice as much money as their peers uh, in the conscript service. So um, it's a little bit about economics, um, but it's also, uh, of course, about the circumstances in Ukraine. Uh, Russia's you know, mobilization has, I think we can say, failed. <laughs> I mean, it has succeeded in um, putting more bodies on the field, but it has failed in, you know, an effective becoming a, an effective fighting force uh, that can beat back the Ukrainians um, in, at the scale I think that was originally imagined. Uh, the Wagner Group is going to be really important to gluing together and patching up holes um, in that mobilization for a long time to come. I expect this war to continue for many years. Uh, two to three would be the minimum I would expect before we reach a point where um, some sort of negotiation leads to a cessation or at least a temporary cessation of hostilities. I, I just, just on a general question of recruitment uh, for the Wagner Group. I mean, from my own experience, I know that any military type deployment or paramilitary type deployment will need a range of skills, be they in communication, be they in weaponry, be they intelligence. Um, they, their own recruiting processes must be very effective to be able to mix that range of skills. <laughs> 
Well, so that's a very interesting question. Um, and it's one that I think, um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying, but I, I could probably spend years more um, looking at the kind of the particular skill sets that tend to make up um, Wagner contingents or tend to be part of the, the menu of um, desired items on, on the list for recruiters for the Wagner group. Here are the things that we've noticed. We've noticed that um, quite a few have experience in the Vede Vede Airborne paratroop uh, services and units. Um, a number of them have special skills in anti-aircraft um, uh, maneuvers and operations. Quite a few have experience in electronic warfare. Uh, a number also are um, deminers, sappers. And so uh, quite a few also have you know, some specialization in communications. So there, there, there clearly is a, a very niche set of, of skills that is um, desi desirable in terms of recruitment. And I think it is very much reflected uh, in the patterns that we see of those. You could even look at the casualties uh, if you wanted to in a very granular way, uh, which is what we've kind of done uh, in a lot of our research is kind of work backwards from the number of uh, so-called Wagner Group fighters who have been killed in, you know, Syria, Ukraine, et cetera. And then we've taken a look at you know, what, where they said they had served, um, you know, prior to their service or during their service with the Wagner Group in, in terms of like Russian military service. Um, and there's a pretty strong prevalence of, you know, special operators um, in those airborne forces, not exclusive, um, but also motor rifle brigades. So again, sort of, um, uh, you know, maneuver operations, reconnaissance operations are also very important um, skills or experiences to have had for this group. Uh, thank you. Um, just touching on, on Syria, you mentioned Syria there, and I have a question here from Valerie Hughes, a, a friend of the Syrian community in Ireland. Here. She said, could Professor Rondo discuss the role of the Wagner Group in Syria today? <clears throat> yes. Um, well, so the Wagner Group now, as we understand it, um, detachments that are there are primarily providing protection for uh, the extractive industry. So um, across Syria, a number of deals have been made with Prigozhin linked companies, uh, most famously uh, Capital and Mercury um, are the two big companies um, that recently I think scored uh, concessions deals uh, in central Syria, if I'm not mistaken, um, for several million dollars, uh, tens of millions of dollars, maybe about 64, if I remember right. Um, and so part of that package is the provision of, of security. Um, so they're there in installations, they're guarding pipelines, they're guarding uh, even you know, phosphate mines, et cetera. And they're doing VIP support um, you know, in Tartu uh, and in Damascus uh, that is providing bodyguard and protective services there. Uh, to the degree that they are doing, continuing to do training uh, of, of local forces, that's a little less clear. I think, again, that bears scrutiny. I think, you know, one of the difficulties now uh, is that uh, the proliferation of Wagner Group contingents is, is so um, large, uh, you know, it's, we see them now, uh, there's talk of their presence potentially in Ivory Coast, as an example, um, you know, Guinea-Bissau that it's, it's actually becoming quite difficult to track with any certainty. Um, it really does require a full scale, um, probably multiple teams in multiple countries to really understand exactly what's happening on the ground in places like Syria. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go back to, to a point that you made in your, your introductory remarks about, you know, they posing a serious threat to the civilian population. Uh, wherever, whatever country that they're deployed in. And, and to some extent, you were uh, not that enamored by the success of sanctions being placed on these people. Um, but what we were talking about are war crimes and um, uh, the, the, therefore the prosecution of the war crimes um, is where the challenge is going to be. Can you discuss that a little bit further as to what actions could possibly be taken by individual countries or by collective of countries to bring them uh, to a point of before a court? So this is where it gets a little tricky. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of debates about the universal jurisdiction clauses in uh, the Rome statutes for the International Criminal Court and, and as to whether or not, um, you know, a, a crime against humanity or a war crime um, that takes place in any jurisdiction, even if it is not a signatory to the Rome statute, um, could be pursued uh, just on grounds of sort of, um, you know, protection of civilians and uh, protection of the, the Geneva Conventions and, and humanitarian law um, defense. It is, it is a really hard problem, uh, I, I will admit that right away, um, to construct a case uh, that would kind of unify all of these pieces in, in one place. But I th think that there are a few options um, for a multi-jurisdictional um, set of cases against Wagner Group oper operatives. Um, one may be uh, this idea of pillage. Um, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that almost universally, um, in, in very few cases, Ukraine is I think probably the one exception, um, there is a great deal of black market um, dealing in gold um, and other types of minerals, uh, oil um, uh, that is taking place under the Wagner Group's watch. Uh, and technically, uh, and, and, and these are, you know, these things are happening in war zones. So technically, um, that would constitute the crime of pillage. It is, you know, uh, kind of exactly as you would imagine it, kind of a medieval kind of uh, running rampant and, and taking goods um, and looting, essentially, uh, the resources of a given country. I think that that's a pretty strong unifying case across almost every single jurisdiction, with the possible exception of Ukraine, although now increasingly, maybe there is a case there, too. Uh, I think that bears looking into. Venezuela is a good example. Uh, you may have seen recently that a number of uh, operatives connected to paramilitary groups were um, arrested, uh, or at least charged, I should say, uh, by the US government for oil bunkering and um, illicit um, uh, trafficking uh, out of Venezuela. Uh, and they were all connected, of course, to uh, a group, uh, a detachment known as Rusich, um, which has also a long affiliation with uh, the Wagner Group umbrella. So while it might be a very difficult course, um, I think, and I mean, it could be years in the making, to be honest with you, um, but it's probably a good idea to get started now on developing a theory of the case, um, whether it's that or whether the better, better lever, lever is a crime of aggression uh, in the case of Ukraine, um, just as sort of a, as a means of ex explaining and exposing um, the different arrangements um, that the Kremlin has put together to allow for these operatives uh, to conduct their missions abroad. Thank you. Um, I have a question from, from the Director of Research here at the IIEA, Barry Colfer. Um, is the Wagner Group best understood as a business seeking to maximize the amount of money it can make? Or is it best understood as a political actor with a defined and understandable mission? Our challenge with the Wagner Group is to kind of um, hold two ideas in, in, in place at the same time. Um, actually, it is a political actor, um, and, and it, but it's not mutually exclusive also. It is, a military, um, it is a military actor that does advance the business interests of the Kremlin. Uh, I think that's the best way to think of it. And uh, there is a reason why there's an overfocus on gold mining um, at a time when Russia is crushed by US and international sanctions. And that's been going on for years now. Um, having gold reserves has been the saving grace for the central bank. Uh, I can guarantee that some of the gold that is being mined in places like CAR and Mali and elsewhere uh, is in some way or another winding up, not just in the pockets of rich Russian oligarchs, that's true, um, and not just in the pockets of you know, corrupt government officials, but some of that funding flow uh, and some of that gold reserve um, is, is being driven into the central bank of Russia. Uh, and I think that's the work ahead, is, is trying to understand exactly how those transactions take place. Um, so to, the best way to understand the Wagner Group is it is both a political entity in so much as it serves 
the political purpose of project, projecting power outwardly um, from Russia into the world. Um, but it is also a business entity um, that basically operates like a cartel. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two final questions. I see that we're running out of time and the questions are still coming through. Um, the, the question is uh, from, from Holst, Horst, excuse me, um, and he's an IIEA member, and he's, he's asking a very delicate question is, the, the Wagner group that are, are prisoners of war as such, that may be taken prisoner, are they considered combatants, legal combatants, or would they be dealt with differently under international law? Depends on the jurisdiction. In the case of Ukraine, um, because Russian nationals are essentially you know, citizens of a party to the hostilities, um, they are not mercenaries, uh, and therefore they must be treated as essentially soldiers um, and prisoners of war in the, in the proper context. Uh, they do not get special treatment, uh, and, and in fact, um, they are just like any other Russian soldier. Uh, so, uh, but in the case of Syria, <laughs> um, where we don't have that situation, I mean, really the only place where we have, uh, you know, Wagner Group uh, as, as prisoners of war is, is in Ukraine, as far as I know, anyway. Um, in those contexts, you know, it's, it's really about the kind of the state of the war itself. Um, this is an interstate conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I think now that's clear. Um, whereas for whatever reasons, uh, the international community was not ready to accede to the idea that um, the 2014 uh, uh, annexation of Crimea um, was also an interstate war. For whatever reasons, uh, we are now in a different state of, uh, of play. And therefore those who are in combat um, and captured in combat, they should be treated as prisoners of war under the standard Geneva Conventions. Okay, thank you. Um, and the final question is on recruitment. Um, we hear rumors that um, the recruiting process is an international process for Wagner Group, and that uh, even special forces that would have been trained by the American forces in Afghanistan are being recruited as part of members of the Wagner Group. How widespread is this international context of the Wagner Group in terms of recruiting? Well, this is, um, you know, this is an interesting change, I think. I guess the, the thing that kind of qualitatively makes the Wagner Group different in this particular era, I'd say around the time of the start of the, the second Libyan offensive, so around 2018, 2019, uh, with the push for Khalifa Haftar's forces onto, onto Tripoli, uh, assisted by the Wagner Group, um, you started to see you know, Russian recruiters who had been training militias in Syria, um, bringing Syrian fighters into Libya. Um, this was the beginning of that trend. And, um, and some of those Syrian fighters also ended up fighting in Azerbaijan. And, and then we heard early on, if you might remember, very, very early at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, this phase of the war, uh, there were rumors of Libyans and Syrians uh, in some sort of mass grave uh, after a major confrontation in, uh, in and around, I think, the Kharkiv area um, in, in Ukraine. So the, the twist with the Afghan forces is not terribly surprising uh, in some ways, and in, in a way, actually, um, depending on their age, um, some of those Afghan fighters may have even had prior experience with the Soviets. One of the strange things, um, or even more recent experience with Russian service providers for things like helicopter repairs uh, and, and maintenance, uh, which of course, for many years, the Russians um, were providing those services uh, through a, a rather odd arrangement uh, uh, where uh, MI-8 and MI-16 helicopters were provided to support uh, Afghan forces. So would not be at all surprising in a way, it's kind of just kind of continuity of relationships. Um, but it is of course, uh, you know, a little bit frightening to think that every time some sort of US or uh, Western contract or presence falls away, um, those, those fighters that have been trained uh, could become part of the, of the Wagner group. 
um, that's certainly concerning. Uh, thank you, Professor Rondo. Um, I know from an Irish Defence Forces perspective, uh, mercenaries and private military companies, as they're now called, um, our first engagement was back in 1963 when we deployed to the Congo. There was a South African by the name of Mad, Mad Mike Hoare, um, which <laughs> he caused great difficulties. But again, the issue of accountability uh, was very difficult to solve and very difficult to prosecute. Uh, Professor Rondo, I'd like to thank you for uh, a most enlightening discussion and for your time here today. I know that a lot of people will have gotten a great deal of knowledge on how this whole area works. Thank you. Thank you.